Barbara Charlotte Ledermann was born the 4th of September 1925 in Berlin, Germany. Her father was Franz Anton Ledermann, a lawyer and musician. Her mother was Ilse Citroën Ledermann, a 21-year-old pianist. Barbara's younger sister, Susanna, was born the 7th of October 1928. The Ledermanns were proud, secular German Jews who deeply appreciated German life and culture. They made a point to expose Barbara and Susanna to music and arts. Barbara was a happy young child who was strong-willed and bright. When Adolf Hitler was elected in January 1933, the Ledermanns were understandably quite worried. The restrictions being put on Jews made life increasingly difficult especially when it was announced that Jewish lawyers, such as Franz Ledermann, could no longer take on non-Jewish clients. As the Ledermanns had relatives in the Netherlands, they decided to immigrate to Amsterdam. Barbara was eight years old. They found a home on Norder Amstelan in a modern, child-friendly neighborhood. Because many other German Jews had fled to the same community, the family was able to adjust quite well socially. Barbara's mother, Ilza, perhaps missed certain luxuries of their previous life, but overall enjoyed the more hands-on approach to raising children in Dutch society. Her father was able to work again once he had studied Dutch law, and the family lived comfortably. Barbara was sent to the nearby Jägerschool, along with Susanna. Here, Barbara met Margot Frank, another German-Jewish immigrant who lived nearby. The two girls were quite different. Margot was serious and academically driven, unlike Barbara, who remained a poor student even after adjusting to the Dutch language. In spite of any differences, Barbara and Margot became best friends and could often be seen riding their bikes to school together. On Sundays, the Ledermans regularly had guests over to enjoy chamber music. Barbara invited Margot and her family to one such event, and this is how the Franks and the Ledermans befriended each other. Margot's younger sister, Anne, became friends with Barbara's younger sister, who was now called Sana. Barbara recalls that she was, of course, closest friends with Margot, but did have a connection with Anne, too. Barbara found Anne to be endlessly curious and extremely bright, always interested in what others were reading and doing. Barbara enjoyed life in Holland, and spent a lot of time enjoying herself and socializing. As she grew, she even developed a passion for dance. But the peaceful life the Ledermans had found in Amsterdam was soon interrupted when the Nazis invaded in May 1940. Franz Lederman remained somewhat optimistic. He knew the Germans as a cultured, modern, and humanistic people. He had faith things would calm down and the German people would put a stop to Nazi terror. But as more and more restrictions were put into place, life for Jews in Holland worsened. Many of the Jews refused to sit by and wait for further developments. Some, and sometimes even entire families, saw suicide as the only alternative. They took sleeping pills, hanged themselves, or, hoping to die in their sleep, turned on the gas jets and closed the windows. Sana and Barbara Lederman watched from the balcony of their apartment as a man in the building across the street from theirs was rescued at the last minute from his gas fill department. Later, Barbara recalled, I remember a man being saved from trying to gas himself and him yelling and screaming, I don't want to, don't do this, don't save me, I want to die. I was 15. This made a huge impression on me. I asked my mother, why does he want to die? My parents told me it's because they're Jews and Hitler doesn't like Jews. It was the first time I was really aware of this. This was one of the first of many traumas Barbara and Sana would see. Like many others, the Ledermans tried to get on with life as normally as possible. In 1941, it was announced that Jewish students could no longer attend public schools. Barbara and Sana would now have to attend the Jewish Lyceum, but the rebellious Barbara refused to go. She was able to convince her father to let her attend a ballet school, as she was still very passionate and talented at dance. 
Barbara soon met Manfred Grunberg, and the two became a couple. Manfred was a member of the resistance in the Netherlands, and convinced Barbara of the Nazis' true intentions, in spite of her father's optimistic beliefs. Franz Lederman still believed that if they followed the laws, they would not be harmed. The stories of extermination camps and mass murder could only be rumors. Unfortunately, many people did not believe such rumors could really be true. Franz Lederman was no exception. But the danger was very real. Manfred was able to provide Barbara with false papers. Luckily, Barbara also had light hair and eyes, so passed easily as Aryan. This was the beginning of Barbara's work in the Resistance. Because she was now living underground at the age of 17, Barbara could no longer live at home with her family. A suitable boarding house was found for her to stay at, where few knew her true identity. Working as a ballet dancer, Barbara was able to stay out after curfew. This made it much easier for her to help transfer other Jews to and from hiding places. She also worked to collect and distribute food and underground newspapers for those in hiding. But the danger for Barbara increased as she started to perform with the well-known ballerina Yvonne Giorgi. Giorgi was a rumored friend of Hitler and often had audiences full of German officers. But partnering with her also gave Barbara some advantage and credibility, useful in her resistance work. But eventually, someone outed Barbara to Ivan Giorgi. But instead of reporting her to the authorities, Giorgi only dismissed Barbara from her position. Barbara did not learn the reason for her dismissal until after the war. Meanwhile, Barbara was terribly homesick. She talked to her family on the phone, but knew it was unsafe to go back and forth often. One never knew if the Nazis were planning another raid. No matter how hard she tried, she could not convince her family to go underground with her. They feared they would be further punished for breaking the law. In June 1943, Barbara finally decided to go home for the night to visit her beloved family. She took great risk putting the yellow star back on and returning to her home neighborhood, where anyone could identify her as Jewish. Barbara later recalled, I hadn't seen my parents for a long time. We talked over the phone. I was very homesick, very homesick, and they wanted to see me. It was terribly dangerous. It was stupid, and I did it anyway. Later, a neighbor came by with urgent news to warn them of. The Nazis were planning to round up and arrest the Jews of the neighborhood in the morning. The area was already closed off, and everyone was trapped. But Barbara still had her false papers, and if no one recognized or thoroughly questioned her, it would be extremely dangerous, but possible, for her to escape. Barbara later recalled, My mother, who had never before spoken up to my father, said to him, Franz, si get, which means Franz, she goes. She has to leave, you know. And I had my papers, I had my papers, couldn't take a thing. My father says to me, Bless you, go. This is the end. I think this is it. This really is it. This is the last time. This is it. He said, you go, you go. Try it. Doesn't matter anymore, you know. Just try it. I didn't even think how fantastic that was, you know, that, at least at that moment, he said, I agree with you. Go. Perhaps in that moment, the Latermans had finally had a strong premonition of what was to come. Instead of coaxing their daughter to stay, they had given her their blessing to go. If Barbara made it, her mother told her, she could try to find her uncle, who might have some money to give her. They could do no more for their eldest daughter. Although they were supportive of her choice, Barbara was unable to convince her family to go with her. At this point, it was likely too late for them to all get out safely anyways. By staying behind and following orders, Mr. and Mrs. Leiderman hoped and believed they were doing the right thing for themselves and their children. Barbara said a tearful goodbye to her family before heading out for the last time. 
Even though it had been announced all non-Jews had to remain indoors, Barbara was able to think quickly. She was not only street smart, but a convincing actress. The officers who questioned her believed she was just a Dutch girl trying to get home from a friend's house. Somehow, and finally with the sympathy of a young officer, Barbara made it back safely. When Barbara's friends visited the home later that day, no one was there. As suspected, her parents and sister had been arrested and sent to Westerbork. Barbara was hopeful that they would be reunited after the war. The following winter was the Dutch famine of 1944 to 1945, Dutch hunger winter. The Nazis had taken for themselves all supplies the Dutch had produced and left the citizens to starve. Barbara was able to sell some jewelry to get by, but she and her friends suffered terribly. They mostly ate at a public meal center where starving citizens were given soup made from tulip bulbs. There was no electricity, little running water, and no coal, meaning no heat in the middle of a harsh winter. An outbreak of fleas further tormented Barbara and many others. This would not be under control until after the war. The starvation and poor conditions Barbara endured affected her body for years after. When the war ended, Barbara was almost 20 years old. Like many others, she went daily to the train station in Amsterdam, hoping for any news of her family. Later, she found out that her parents and sister had been deported to Auschwitz and gassed soon after their arrival in November 1943. When Ilse Lederman learned her family would be deported from Westerbork the next morning, she wrote a few lines to her daughter. My darling, we are about to depart on our first long journey in a long time. My little Barbara, we will see each other again. A fellow prisoner had been able to mail this. By the time Barbara received it, her family had likely already been killed. Naturally, Barbara was devastated. Though her family never came back from the camps, someone she had known since childhood did, Otto Frank, the sole survivor of the Frank family. Otto Frank had survived Auschwitz, but his wife and daughters had perished. Knowing Barbara had lost her whole family, Otto Frank offered to take care of her. He had also done this for Hannah Gosler, who had been Anne's best friend and her little sister. Although very grateful, Barbara refused. She wanted to have her own life and move forward. She wanted to leave Europe. In 1947, Barbara emigrated to the United States. Because she could not support herself as a dancer, she took a job with the Ringling Brothers Circus and later worked selling cosmetics. She met and married a man named Martin Rodbell in 1950. He would later become a noted biochemist and win a Nobel Prize in 1994. Barbara and Martin had four children, Paul, Suzanne, Andrew, and Philip. As she says, it's as if she had two children for herself and two for her sister. Barbara worked to give herself and her family a stable and happy life in their home of Maryland, USA. Like many others who had lived through the war, Barbara struggled. She had been through a great trauma and great loss. Among other things, she experienced survivor's guilt. In the early 1950s, Barbara wrote the following poem. Autobiography. Many women am I. Reach far into history walked through the desert with Moses, daughter of sages and wise men, walked through Rome, Spain, Poland, Russia, walking, walking to Germany, Holland, daughter of poets, musicians, painters. All Europe, its thought, religion, its sufferings are mine. Holocaust, death all around, young and old, again, again, well known this, prepare to fight, live and do. Alone now, as often before, start over, walk to America for husband and children. So nice, so nice, what next? Children, beautiful, will they suffer? 
of course, later sometime. Rest a while, find myself, contribute, reach out and grow. Walk with my daughter hand in hand, hope again, always hope, walk on and on, hope. Her life in America was quite different from the one in Holland she had left. It took a lot of strength for Barbara and other survivors to keep moving forward in life. But Barbara still maintained contact with people she had known back in Europe. Until his death in 1980, Barbara kept in touch with Otto Frank. She even visited him in Switzerland and was one of the first people to read Anne's diary. Barbara was incredibly moved by Anne's words. The Anne in the diary had grown significantly since they had last seen each other. But like Barbara's sister and many other Jewish children, Anne had been robbed of her life and potential. Anne's fame grew, and in 1959, a movie was made about her life in hiding. Barbara and her husband went to see it. According to Life magazine, when she and her husband went to the Anne Frank movie, she stood debating whether to go in. Finally, she decided not to. I've seen too much human suffering already, she said. In her life, Barbara has worked with and spoken to adolescents about her experiences. She also shares with them the things she has learned. Additionally, Barbara has given numerous interviews about her life that are available online. In 1998, Barbara's husband Walter died at the age of 73. Barbara was once interviewed by Dick Gordon from American Public Media. When asked what advice she had for teens today, she gave the following response. When I'm talking to these girls, I keep saying, Think for yourselves. Think for yourselves. That's what's important. You know, what is good for you? If you if you are in a difficult situation and you know that by leaving you do not hurt the others, but you're helping yourself, you do it. You only have your one life. And, and you have to do... You mustn't hurt them. And maybe by doing what is good for you at that moment you're actually helping them or you can help them later you don't know you don't know what life's going to throw at you Barbara still lives at the age of 96 in Chapel Hill North Carolina there is more to Barbara's story than what was put in this video to learn more about Barbara read or see letters from the Latermans by Afori Publishing Anne Frank, The Biography by Melissa Mueller, and Daring to Resist, Three Women Face the Holocaust, 1999 TV movie by PBS. To learn more about Barbara online and to view this video's content sources, visit the links in the description. To view the descriptions and credits of the photographs used in the video, see the description.